So, Dennis, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Eric. Good Thank to be you here. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm wondering, what what are you working on now? Are you uh, are you uh, uh, doing scientific work? Are you teaching? I know you've you've worn many hats over your career, and I'm curious where, what one you're wearing now. <laughs> well, it's true. I wear a number of hats. Uh, well, right now I'm I'm in the academic mode. I've just uh, I've been teaching a course in ethnobotany and ethnopharmacology in Ecuador over the summer uh, for Arizona State uh, Field Studies program. Uh, I was teaching with uh, Kat Harrison, who, as you know, is uh, Terrence's ex-wife. So I guess she's still my sister-in-law. But we uh, we teach together we uh, together we've been uh, teaching courses for the University of Minnesota in Hawaii every January called uh, plants and human affairs and uh, this uh, this summer gig if you want to call it that was kind of a version of that but we transplanted it to the Ecuadorian Amazon so that's what I've been doing with my summer uh, just trying to stay employed and and then uh, in the fall, I'm teaching uh, uh, several courses here at the University of Minnesota, one in uh, ethnopharmacology, one on uh, botanical medicines, and, and a new course uh, in the College of Liberal Arts, which I haven't taught before, but it should be fun. It's called uh, Cross-Cultural Perspectives on Drugs. So <laughs> that's uh, that's what I'm doing these days. Excellent. Now, when you, uh, you know, were a young man, was did your interest in ethnobotany or botany or the science of of, uh, of pharmacology and biology did that um, emerge from an earlier interest in, uh, in in visionary plants and experiences, or was it or was it vice versa? No, I'd have to say my interest came out of our early experiences, uh, many of which my brother and I shared. A fascination, really, with uh, altered states, uh, and especially the psychedelic DMT. Uh, we were children of the '60s, I guess you could say, and you know, my brother was uh, in school at Berkeley at that time, and I was still in high school. But I visited him over the summers, and uh, you didn't encounter DMT very much. It was kind of rare, uh, but we did encounter it uh, in a synthetic form, and we were fascinated by it. We thought that DMT in some ways is the, was the quintessential entheogen or psychedelic, and we determined to follow up on that, and we didn't really know how to do that, but uh, I think when we discovered shamanism, uh, and initially I guess that was through uh, Carlos Castaneda's first book, The Teachings of Don Juan, uh, and then we understood that there is a whole tradition of using these visionary plants in the shamanic context, and so that gave us a lead, uh, a direction in which to explore it, and, and then shortly after that we discovered the work of uh, Ari Schultes, the famous Harvard ethnobotanist who spent years in the Amazon uh, collecting plants, but also exploring and discovering all of these many psychoactive plants that are used in South America. And he's, uh, you know, deservedly known as probably the world's expert on uh, hallucinogenic plants. I mean, unfortunately, he left the, this realm in, I think, 1998 or somewhere around there, but uh, really it was his writings that inspired us initially to go to South America, and, and you know, he's been a, a hero figure, a very admired mentor for many people in the area of ethnopharmacology, and it's really, you know, in, in some ways it's because of Schultes that I keep going back to South America, I just can't stay away from it. And so, uh, you know, that led us into, you know, kind of the, the path that we got on that we talked about in the Invisible Landscape and, and my brother's 
book, uh, True Hallucinations, which is a much more sort of accessible narrative of what led us down to go down there in 1971 and uh, get into a, a whole lot of things that we really had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> but but that was it. That's what got it started. And then, you know, when I came back from that experience, I, I realized that I had to learn a lot more science. I had to learn neuroscience and botany and pharmacology and that's sort of what got me on the path to uh, becoming scientific about it. Dennis, can I, can I ask you, did you find uh, it was frustrating in your scientific pursuits trying to talk to other scientists about this stuff? I mean, were you well-received? I know you still teach in, you know, academic, uh, you know, context. So have you found that it's just a battle trying to deal with some of these people? Because I did biochemistry as well, and I found that, uh, you know, even trying to talk about that kind of stuff to most scientists they get really bummed out so I was just wondering if you had <laughs> positive experiences with that or if they were negative well yeah it's 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 kind of a tough road to hoe uh, in some ways it is but you know I mean what what you find is that even in the academic context you know there are a lot of pretty open-minded people hmm. and if you uh, and you find that you can connect with them. I mean, they may not be very uh, upfront about their interests, uh, but they are there. And I guess what makes me different is, you know, I don't know when to shut up. I mean, I don't. I'm not the kind of person to sit down and and stop making noise. You know, mm -hmm. and I've this has fascinated me all of my life. And uh, I've gotten some breaks, you know. I've been able to continue in this work. I mean, uh, maybe if I'd gone a more conventional academic route, I'd be a, you know, distinguished professor somewhere instead of simply a assistant professor in a marginal department. But the point is that, uh, you know, you do find the opportunities uh, to, to work on these things. And... You know, in the field of neuroscience, for example, I think, you know, although they're reluctant to talk about it, if you ta if you can make personal connections with many people in that field, you know, you find that very often what motivated them initially to go into the field was a desire to, you know, investigate these mm. kinds of things, to look into the neuroscience of altered states, whether through psychedelics or other other technologies, you know, and then people become faced with the realities of they have to stay employed, they have to get grants, they have to do all these things, and so, you know, it is politically incorrect, uh, but in some ways, I think not to acknowledge your interest is intellectually dishonest, and so I... Yep. I've, I've tried to remain honest to my sort of original mission. Yeah, I think it's a, your, your career is an, an example of that. I've been, I've been thinking a lot about integrity lately and how uh, integrity kind of keeps its own momentum going. Like, there are so many rational reasons for you, I'm sure, op over many years, for you to pull back on your, your interests and your background for the sake of, you know, less anxiety for your family, for your gig, whatever it is. And, and yet it seems like by staying uh, kind of true and honest in that deeply scientific, in an ethical sense, way, uh, about just being clear and, and honest about what's, what's, what's going on before you, uh, it seems like you've, you've developed a certain, uh, you know, momentum or uh, coherence about, about your work that really, uh, that really comes through your, your teaching and your, and your talking. You know, a few weeks ago we had uh, Mike Jay on, a British historian of, of, of science and of drugs, and he, his new book, uh, The Atmosphere of Heaven, is about uh, the origins of the Pneumatic Institute and the discovery of nitrous oxide. Uh -huh. And, uh, and one, of the, um, one of the things he talks about in that book that's so fascinating that we talked about a little bit on, on air was uh, the fact that in, in those days, if you were a scientist exploring compounds, poisons, uh, anything that affected the mind, it was completely routine to take it on yourself. And Humphrey Davy, who's like one of the great scientists of, of, of British history, of the early 19th century, who was one of these people who first explored the psychoactive properties of nitrous oxide, in fact, in fact became quite a fan of it, 
um, was was legendary for for taking audacious risks in terms of self experimentation. So self experimentation was once part of the nobility of the scientist, and then at some point in the 20th century, it get it gets split so much so that it's almost forbidden to mention subjective experience or personal uh, experience. That that there has to be this rigorous divide between the two, and it's it's really unfortunate. It does seem like that there's some uh, integration happening these days, at least a little sense of return. Do, do you have a sense that there's there's a there's a way in which that that paradigm of the total split between objective and subjective is is, is breaking down a bit? Well, yes, I think so. I, th I think it's I think it's a slow process. But I, I think what you say about self experimentation is is you know quite right. I mean, back in the day when Humphrey Davies and William James and people like this were exploring all this, you know, not only was it accepted to self-experiment, it was expected that that's what you do. That's, you know, I mean, the, the mission was to investigate these altered states, and it was not ethical not to experience them yourself. Uh, I think in the modern era, the, a person that exemplifies that very much is the, the chemist Alexander Shulgin, uh, who many of your listeners may know about. He uh, was a pharmacologist and a chemist working for Dow Chemical back in the 50s, and he got interested in what uh, pharmacologists call structure-activity relationships. Uh, which are the relationships between the structure of a molecule, a drug, and its activity, its pharmacological activity. Well, he uh, had a profound uh, experience with peyote early in his career, and so he got very interested in mescaline and decided to do structure activity work with mescaline and went on to make over 300 different mescaline analogs all of which he tested on himself, you know, in a very serious, careful way, along with uh, he had a trusted group of, of uh, human guinea pigs, basically friends of his, who were, you know, psychotherapists, doctors, pharmacologists, you know, pretty serious people. And they all carefully evaluated, you know, his compounds. They kept careful notes, and they produced... Uh, a tremendous body of knowledge, uh, you know, about these things, about structure activity relationships of these psychedelics. But uh, Ali, uh, but uh, Sasha Shulgin, everyone calls him Sasha. He paid a price for his intellectual honesty. You know, he didn't keep his job at Dow Chemical. He became an independent consultant and. He was able to continue his work uh, legally. He had permission from the DEA to, you know, continue his work as a research scientist. But he never sort of achieved the the academic cachet that he might have if he backed off from that, you know. But he continued to work, and in my opinion, uh, you know, the man should have been given the Nobel Prize. I mean, he is he is contributed more to an understanding of what you might call the brain-mind relationship, really, than, than anyone else of, of his day, and yet he's been sort of, you know, in some way stigmatized as, as some kind of, you know, wild-eyed, um, irresponsible person, and that's just not the case. So I guess Sasha and I are on the same wavelength, although... You know, uh, I, ne I don't aspire to come to his level of accomplishment, but that's an example. Um, you know, and, and that, that sort of relates to this whole issue about, you know, what is science really supposed to be about? I mean, in its purest form, science is supposed to be about exploring the unknown. It's about discovering new knowledge and... Uh, you know, in its sort of idealistic embodiment, it's it's the search for truth. And, you know, I think that, you know, these aspects of science fade into the background because we live in an era of big science. And science is an expensive proposition. You know, it's funded by largely through government subsidies. 
and so that really puts a lot of restraint on uh, a lot of constraints on what people can do in the context of of big science you know and, and I think a lot of scientists lose sight of this fact uh, yeah. you know what is science about the search for truth no it's about publishing papers and having graduate students and getting grants and, and playing the whole game and you know the search to uncover knowledge somehow you know it gets overlooked in all this activity so that's unfortunate yeah the the ironies that, that surround the, this issue of big science or institutional science grow even greater when you start talking about psychoactives because of course while we can say psychoactives and think of uh, scheduled substances, popular ske scheduled substances like cannabis or LSD or cocaine, that, of course, psychoactive substances are also a, an enormous industry and that there's this ex exploding, metastasizing world of uh, prescription pharmaceutical psychoactives that are, you know, being sort of like this large-scale experimental project on the, the, the global population, right. um, so that a lot of the same issues about subjective, subjectivity, the relationship of agency to uh, drugs, the, the, you know, the, the, the nation, relationship of identity and experience to different uh, neurological systems or neurotransmitters, like all of these things are very much in the air. They're very much big business. So that the, the, the contradictions of our of our relationship to psychoactives and also within science between this sort of you know deeper truth and surface truth uh, become even greater when you look at these these substances. I mean, how do you? I mean, from where you stand and with your with your you know you're, you're very planted in. Uh, you know, biological pharmacology and ethnopharmacology as opposed to, uh, you know, synth synthetic production of, of psychoactives. But how does that whole world look like to you as a, as a scientist and as someone who's um, well, who's I, open I, I, to I think it? Well, I think it leads to a certain cognitive dissonance, and it certainly leads to a mixed message, you know, when you're trying to speak to young people, for example, about drugs and about their relationship to drugs, because, you know, on the one hand, you have this whole uh, sort of, as you say, the psychopharmaceutical industry, and this notion that, you know, we can engineer personality, essentially, and it's perfectly okay to give uh, young people all these drugs for ADHD and for depression, and now the the atypical antipsychotics are becoming quite popular. And and basically, these are band-aid, you know, solutions for deep, uh, I think, crises of the spirit. And yet, on the other hand, you've got the the shamanic plants, the the psychedelic plants or theogenic plants, if you prefer and the tradition of shamanism, which is practiced uh, in other parts of the world. It's practiced in most of the world, but it's, it's utterly forbidden uh, in this country, and it's become an underground thing. Uh, and yet, I think that, especially the young people I speak with, you know, there's a sense that, you know, this is essentially a hypocritical situation. Many of the... Uh, Students that I teach seem to have been on one or other psychopharmaceutical at some time during their career. It's quite common. I would, at a guess, I'd say probably 40% of the students in my classes, you know, have been treated with one or more psychopharmaceuticals during the course of their high school and early college careers. And so then there is that expectation that this is perfectly all right. Many of them confided me, yeah, of course I smoke pot. It, it has less side effects than the drugs, you know, they want to prescribe me and that kind of thing. So there is an element, I think, in this, in this use of these so-called, you know, prohibited drugs or these, these drugs that are not accepted. There's a certain effort going on to essentially self-medicate uh, or to find some kind of a spiritual uh, reward that you know that that the modern, the current 
sort of biomedical approach to to personality, what I what I call chemical personality engineering, uh, is not providing. Yeah, I, I often think about the, the Western uh, psychopharmacology is kind of like lame shamanism. <laughs> that whereas well, we, it, we, we, they, we tend to hear that like shamans are like bad doctors, like or you know from a from a traditional Western perspective, it's like they're they're acting like doctors, but they don't really know what they're doing. It's almost the reverse when you start dealing with issues of mind and body, where it's it's like it, on some level it's all shamanism. It's just that they do it very poorly and it's very expensive. Well, um, I want to I want to start well, the light. I mean, I, I would agree with you that it's lame. <laughs> I don't agree with you that it's shamanism. <laughs> In fact, this is the problem. They've taken exactly that element out of it, you know, and, and the notion most doctors who prescribe these things are not even psychiatrists. They're not even that qualified to provide no any kind of, you know, other support. And, well, the, uh, the way in which I think it is like shamanism is that, it's a it's a it's a cultural narrative about efficacy. If you grow up in a culture where the shaman is the guy who's got the the power, I, right. I'm not talking about specifically uh, ayahuasca shamanism, but just that there's a sort of traditional healer and they have the power, and that part of their efficacy is the fact that that's the story that we believe. I mean, there is a way right. in which there are elements of I'm not saying that, that shamanic pharmacology is all placebo effect, but there's an element of kind of performativity and sort of agreement that lays the groundwork for real healing in traditional situations. And I think that in, in many ways, when you look at the statistics on, uh, on, on SSRIs, for example, that they're actually not very efficacious, but they're just enough over the line to make them ha be passed off as being powerful, and they're not right. even that powerful. And a lot of what people are actually doing is just it's their own decisions, it's their own will it's the theater of the drug or the pill the idea that the pill has an answer that is 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 producing a lot of uh, some of the effect and so that's the way in which i mean that it's another theater of medical uh healing but it right. does it in a really poor way <laughs> and, and and much of the efficacy to the degree that there is efficacy with these things it comes from the placebo effect and i think that what you know what shamans i mean if if ever psychedelics are going to be used in a therapeutic context in a biomedical context and you know there are now signs that that's beginning to come back but what what uh, therapists have to understand is you cannot separate the the pharmacology from the context i mean this we knew this from the earliest days of leary and metzner and these people Set and setting is everything, you know, and what the shamans do is they create a context to allow these experiences to unfold in a safe environment and an environment where they, they the shamans, know what the person is going through. They're usually going through it with them, and they can provide some modulation of the experience in order to guide the person through it by using, you know, Icaro's magical songs, music, uh, different kinds of cleansing. In other words, they set up a, a an environment that's, it, it's well, it's not exactly psychotherapeutic, but the effect of it is the same. It provides a context in which the person can let this stuff come out, let it unfold, and then integrate it. That's what's lacking in psychopharmacology. It's not about letting things unfold. It's about it's about repressing it. It's about damping it down and essentially putting a band-aid over all of these unconscious processes. So yes, the person appears normal and can function, but in some sense, you know, none of the problems that led them to that state in the first place are, are really addressed by these by these uh, psychopharmaceuticals. Well, that's a, that's a great segue. I want to talk a little bit more about um, ayahuasca. Um, before I do that, I want to uh, let people know that you can call in uh, and ask a question of Dennis at 888-873-4643. It's a toll call, a toll-free call. And uh, you can also email your questions uh, to mind at technosis.com, T-E-C-H. G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. That's also my website, www.technosis.com. And before we go back to Dennis, I just want to play 
uh, a recording of a shaman in Colombia that was recorded in uh, 1976. It's from a really excellent, a fairly obscure CD called Yage Pinta. And these are uh, sh psychedelic shaman songs of Santiago Mutamba Joy. So this is the real deal. This is just recorded on a cheap uh, tape deck in, the, in, in an ayahuasca uh, ritual setting. And we just, I just want to play a little bit of this, uh, of this track. Shamanism, these magic songs are called Icaros, I C A R O S. And I was, while he was singing, I was just looking at iTunes here to see what they have. They actually have quite a list of Icaros. So your readers might check it out if they're interested in more of that. Uh, I'm not really here to plug anybody's Icaros, but there's quite a few of them out there. Um, but the Icaros are one way, as you say, to modulate this this setting, this sensory oral environment. And uh, it has a lot to do, I think, with synesthesia, which is one of the things that psychedelics facilitate, the translation of one sensory modality into another. And, for example, you see music or, you know, you hear colors, this kind of thing. And uh, this is a common uh, experience on psychedelics, and most people don't experience it any other way. So the shaman can use the Icaros in some ways to modulate and guide what the person is seeing. They can actually, you know, influence their vision. And within the context of ayahuasca, uh, ceremonies. It's it's not uncommon for everyone to be having a similar experience. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it telepathy exactly, 
<laughs> but it's something. Well, telepathy is good because they used to call some of those substances telepathines, right? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. When harming was first isolated from Banisteriopsis back in the 30s, uh, it was called telepathine. Yeah. And then only later was it called harming because they found that it was identical uh, to an alkaloid that had already been discovered in Paganum harmala, which is a, 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 a shrub that's native to the Mideast and which may have also been used either as an MAO uh, inhibitor in some Middle Eastern preparation such or whatever. But, but harmine, because it was discovered earlier, it was named after Paganum harmala, and then they found that telepathine was... Uh, compound and and so then that earlier name took precedence but yeah um, there was did you ever have like telepathic experiences when that you experienced with other people at the same time have I mm -hmm. yes mm. yes absolutely both on ayahuasca and mushrooms it's it's not really that uncommon well, and one other thing, actually, I was been dying to <laughs> ask you about, Dennis. In along those lines, is one of those shared experiences uh, on these substances uh, regarding the self-transforming machine elves. And I wanted to ask you if you had any particular uh, experiences with these guys. They're like these kind of, you know, anthropomorphic creatures that many people experience uh, when right. they go into these states. And right. I personally have experienced them. Also, I was. Um, dismembered by them in the experience that I had, and that's very common. You know, Mercea Eliade talks about that, and I know in your you're in Terence's book, uh, The Invisible Landscape. You guys mention it, but I was just curious if you had had any like particularly mind blowing experiences with the self transforming machine elves. And I also just like to say that name a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What? Well, well, the experience you had of being dismembered and put back together. I mean, mm -hmm. that's classical shamanism. You know, that goes on. That's part of shamanic initiation virtually in every shamanic tradition that's practiced the world over, and uh, whether or not facilitated with psychoactives. Uh, but the self-transforming machine elves, I mean, yeah, it's a great phrase. I, I don't, to be honest, and uh, I, I don't get self-transforming machine elves, uh, or at least I wouldn't call them that. But I definitely get a sense of entities or, you know, there's another intelligence over there, wherever over there is on the other side of this membrane, in this parallel reality and they you could call them you know jeweled basketballs or or intelligent self-transforming machine elves or something but they definitely have a sense uh one has a sense that they are separate from you and they're not you know i mean i mean common sense tells you that they have to be some other part of your your brain that's presenting itself as different than yourself but but who really knows but they do have this sort of you know um, uh, on the DMT experience they do have this sort of you know almost comical aspect to them they're very excited they're very enthusiastic they want you to pay attention to what they're showing you uh, with ayahuasca, you don't get that so much. Ayahuasca is DMT, but ayahuasca is DMT because of its pharmacokinetics. It's instead of being compressed into 10 minutes or so, it's stretched out over four hours or mm. so. So it presents itself in a different kind of way. Um, but the sense of an other, the sense of connection with entities, that the ayahuasca girls might call spirits, you know, and you certainly, or you know, you certainly have that sense, is something that's very common in these tryptamine, tryptamine states. Um, psilocybin is a tryptamine, ayahuasca and DMT all sort of share the same, if you want to say, phenomenology, or they're they're different uh, ways to access a similar dimension that you might call the tryptamine the tryptamine dimension and actually there's a very interesting book just that's been out maybe a year that some of your readers 
our listeners might be interested in. It's called Inner Paths to Outer Space. And uh, it's an anthology uh, edited by Rick Strassman, who is the MD that was the first person to achieve FDA approval to do a clinical study with uh, DMT back in the early 90s. And his work, he wrote, his earlier book was called DMT, The Spirit Molecule, which is actually also very interesting. But this later book kind of addresses the issue of, you know, is there a reality out there? Is this just an aspect of the self, or is there really another dimension? That well, that has... relates back actually to something we had talked about a few shows back, Eric, on the I Ching show about coming into contact with something outside of yourself. And I just think it's kind of interesting, and I'll just say this as a little bit woo-woo, because there are actually 64 beta-carbolines that we have discovered so far. There's also 64 hexagrams in the I Ching, and, of course, 64 base pairs in DNA. So I just think that's kind of interesting when you're considering if there's some kind of, if it's, is it outside, is it inside, is it... Same thing, 64 beta so. carbolines, you say. Oh, that's a new one. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. <laughs> Very <laughs> interesting. I wanted to ask you also, when you're um, either you know, in the throes of experience or contemplating some of these more out, outside questions about the nature of entities, the nature of consciousness, how does consciousness fit in the cosmos, is there a certain point where you're, you feel your kind of more traditional scientific training and questioning sort of drops off? Or do you feel like you're actually able to go into the heart of these experiences and these questions with a somewhat different angle or, 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 or strategy than people who, who, who are not really that, that, who don't really know science, who, aren't, who are not practitioners, who don't really understand that kind of, uh, that, that kind of thinking or that kind of approach? Well, that's a good question. Uh, no, I think it's, I think, again, I think you walk a fine line. I think that, um, I, I, I think that the scientific sort of stance and kind of a, a, a kind of a healthy skepticism and uh, uh, an emphasis on empiricism, you know, what is it you're experiencing, uh, you know, is, is a good, Stance to take, but I think I mean initially it helps keep you grounded. But but I think also it's very important to recognize the limitations of science. And these these psychedelics, for me, if if they do nothing else, they're a constant reminder of how little we know. You know, and and science tends to arrogate to itself the idea that you know we've. We pretty well understand how the world is made up. We, you know, there's a little mopping up left to be done, but basically we've got it figured out. No, we don't have any of it figured out. We have <laughs> such a tiny slice of reality uh, figured out that we need to cultivate humility and we need to remember how little we know, really. I mean, science. Science is inherently limited because science works on what you can physically measure. And science is very good at taking very tiny pieces of reality, very tiny slices of reality, and dissecting them in detail and describing them in detail. But when it comes to the big picture, how does all this fit together, science it's not so good, you know. I mean, there is no overarching scientific paradigm that explains, you know, the, the very odd situation that we find ourselves in, you know, in the universe. Just the fact that we're minded entities with a subjective world that, you know, mind is real. We know it's real because we live inside minds. You know, we are minds. And... This is why science is so uncomfortable in some way, I think, when it comes to trying to develop paradigms that explain consciousness. You know, they, they wish it was all neurochemistry. They wish it could all be explained in terms of brain electrical activity and this kind of thing. But I don't think it can be. And I think, you know, any, any scientific paradigm uh, that purports to explain consciousness that doesn't take account of these realms of experience is doomed to be incomplete. 
Uh, and this is why, you know, the conversation gets a little uncomfortable when you confront neuroscientists with this, you know. What about this, doctor? You know, how does this fit into your reductionist paradigm? And the fact is it doesn't because I think, you know, I, I just think our understanding is very limited in some ways. Great. That's, a, that's an excellent answer. Hey, we have a, uh, a caller uh, from uh, Arizona, Oliver. Oliver. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question for Dennis. Um, I've read uh, True Hallucinations, and I was just wondering if you could say anything about uh, the relationship between the Icaros and your experiments with hypercarbolation. Well, yes. Yes and no, because given limited time, I mean, we've almost eaten up the whole hour here. I'm not going to go into hypercarbolation <laughs> yeah. in any detail. But this idea that, you know, we could use sound to actually affect chemical reactions or affect physiological transformations on the molecular level uh, is not so far from the notions from the ways that Icaros and these sorts of things might be used in traditional ayahuasca healing. I mean, much of ayahuasca uh, usage shamanically is about healing, and the the uh, the shaman, the ayahuascaro, ha has various tools that he can use, and one of them is sound. You know, I mean, there are songs that can be used for healing. There are stones that can be used for healing. There are, you know, these magical things called virotes, which are which are conceived as uh, little darts that can be sort of psychically transferred into a person to cause harm to them, but also to counteract these malevolent forces. So this is all sort of grades over into the area of, uh, you know, psychic healing. I mean, much of what the shaman does in this altered state is to look inside the person and using a kind of psychic x-ray in some ways, they can tell where the problems are, you know, and what to do to fix them. And it's not exactly a, it's not a diagnostic you know, procedure like a doctor might carry out because the understanding is that almost all illness and, you know, almost all illness comes from magical forces. Even if it's a physical illness, it's because somebody put the whammy on you. And so you have to address, you know, you have to address it on that level and then the physical illness will resolve. Now, you know... Dennis, we have, a, we have another qu question, although we don't have that much time. It's a big sure. one. Sure. Um, this is a, an email question from, uh, from Jay at uh, Arthur Magazine, and he was just wondering about how uh, you, you feel about Terrence's tw 2012 theories. You know, just in a nutshell, he came up with this idea of the time wave that posited a kind of great end of the cycle at this date in December of 2012 and, and sort of linked it with the I Ching. And it was kind of a, it's a very esoteric, kind of prophetic idea but these days, of course, it's gained a lot of currency. The 2012 idea is very popular. Uh, uh -huh. How do you feel about it now where you're, where, where you're, from where you sit? Well, it's hard, again, hard to answer that question in a, in a short time. But, but basically, I, uh, my take on 2012, at least on Terence's time wave theory, is I've always been very skeptical about, about the time wave theory. And basically because it's not a theory, you know, it can't be disproven. And a theory to be a good theory, you have to you have to articulate what will disprove it. And Terence never really did that. But now of course 2012 has emerged as a cultural meme because of the whole Mayan calendar thing. And when it comes to 2012, I tend to, again, I tend to retreat back into my scientific stance and say, well, nobody really knows, you know, but let's wait and see, you know. I mean, I guess we're close enough that all we have to do is sort of keep our skeptical powder dry and just say, well, we'll see. But we should also remember that, you know, no prophecy has ever come true. You know, so based on that, I'm not canceling my appointments for 2013. 
uh, you know, and and I'm just sort of, and in some sense, I, I think that the whole 2012 expectation, particularly to the degree that it's linked to a particular day, you know, is unhealthy. I mean, it's a way of shirking our responsibility, you know. I mean, hell, we may not make it to 2012 the way things are going, you know, so we can't afford to sit around and wait for 2012, and after that it will all be good. You know, we need to get to work right now to save our butts, if I can use that term. You know, we – you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, you know, the space aliens are not coming to save us. Jesus is not coming to save us. The only people that are going to save us is ourselves. You know, we've got to get ourselves – out of this mess we're in and I think that all of this focus on 2012 is in some way just another way to shirk our responsibility and not face up to you know what we're faced with and well how, how do you see ayahuasca playing into this this issue of, of the urgency of our situation well I I think that ayahuasca I think what's happening with ayahuasca and and the way that it is sort of uh, uh, you know, in a way, it's emerging out of the Amazon and it's going global. And some people have decried this, but I actually think it's a very hopeful thing. And I think it's essentially uh, a further unfolding of this evolutionary, uh, co-evolutionary relationship that we have with these plants. I think that, and ayahuasca in some way is now you know, leading the charge, but we've had these relationships with these plants. The problem is that, that on an evolutionary time scale, these things unfold, you know, over millennia, over sometimes millions of years. Now, you know, with the acceleration in, in uh, the global crisis and the impending planetary disaster, you know, in some ways, you know, if these if these psychedelics are in some ways, you know, the biosphere or Gaia or however you want to formulate it, trying to get us to wake up, you know, then that's all to the good. I, I don't know if you know, I wrote an essay a few years ago called uh, Ayahuasca and Human Destiny uh, that kind of addresses some of this. Um, I can is, that on, is that online, Dennis? It is somewhere. I can send it to you, and you're welcome to post it. And but, there's always uh, there's always Google. Well, and there's always Google, right? It, it's there somewhere. I haven't posted it, but uh, but I'd be happy to have you put it on your site if if you'd like. Well, Dennis McKenna, thanks so much for joining us uh, here on Expanding yeah, it, Mind. It, You've it expanded seemed, my it mind. Like it seems like we barely touched the surface of it here. No. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly uh, how quickly an hour goes when you're, when you're okay. having a, a good a good conversation. Uh, thanks, uh, Maja. I wanted to uh, announce next week we'll be having Jeff Warren, who's a remarkable Canadian science writer who wrote a marvelous book about the mind and consciousness called uh, the Head Trip, and he's a, a very energetic, very entertaining fellow. Uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, a great chat. And once again, you've been listening to Expanding Mind on the Progressive Radio Network. Any last words, Maja? Uh, I think I, I hate having last words because that means I can't talk anymore, but <laughs> I want to say have a good time. All right. Thanks again. Okay, Eric and Maja, great to talk with you. Maybe we can circle back sometime and revisit some of this stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay.